a first chapter Friday read aloud of Found and an interview with the author Margaret Peterson Haddix. Hi, my name is Amanda Zeba. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm so excited because I'm going to be reading to you from a book by one of my favorite middle grade authors, Margaret Peterson Haddix. And one of the reasons I love her is because she has so many books, like over 40. So if you're the kind of person who struggles to find a book you like, and then once you finish it, figure out what you're going to read next, Margaret Peterson Haddix is the perfect author for you because once you fall in love with one of her books, there are many, many, many others to enjoy. The book that I'm going to be reading to you today is called Found. It's the first book in the Missing series. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to read you the back of the book so you know what it's about. And then I'm going to read you the first chapter. But then, even better than all of that, is I'm going to have a chance to talk with Margaret Peterson Haddix. And you're going to be able to listen in on the interview. We're going to talk about where she gets her ideas. And if she ever worries about running out of them. I mean, after 40 books, like... What if she's written all the ideas that she has? Like, what is she going to do next? Stay tuned for all of that and a great story. My copy of the book doesn't have uh, the blurb on the back, so I'm going to read it from my phone here real quick. One night, a plane appeared out of nowhere. The only passengers aboard, 36 babies. As soon as they were taken off the plane, it vanished. Now, 13 years later, two of those children are receiving sinister messages, and they begin to investigate their past. Their quest to discover where they really came from leads them to a conspiracy that reaches from the far past to the distant future. And it will take them hurtling through time. In this exciting new series, best-selling, Margaret, best-selling author Margaret Peterson Haddix brings an element of suspense that will keep readers on the edge of their seats. So this is the first book in a series of eight and we're just going to dive in. So, Found by Margaret Peterson Haddix, and actually I'm not gonna read you the first chapter, I'm gonna read you the prologue. And the prologue is a part of a story that comes before the actual story begins, but it contains important information for the reader to know. Not all books have prologues, um, but this one does, and that's where we're gonna start. It wasn't there, then it was. Later, that was how Angela Dupree would describe the airplane, over and over to one investigator after another until she was told to never speak of it again. But when she first saw the plane that night, she wasn't thinking about mysteries or secrets. She was wondering how many mistakes she could make without getting fired. How many questions she dared ask before her supervisor, Monique, would explode. That's it. You're too stupid to work for Skytrail's air. Get out of here. Angela had used a post-it note to write down the code for standby passengers who'd received a seat assignment at the last minute, and she'd stuck it to her computer screen. She knew she had, but somehow, between the flight arriving from St. Louis and the one leaving for Chicago, the post-it note had vanished. Any minute now, she thought some standby passenger would show up at the counter asking for a boarding pass, and Angela would be forced to turn to Monique once more and mumble, uh, what was that code again? And then Monique, who had perfect hair and perfect nails and a perfect tan and had probably been born knowing all the Sky Trails codes, would grit her teeth and narrow her eyes and repeat the code in that slow, fake patient voice she'd been using with Angela all night. The voice that said behind the words, I know you're severely mentally challenged, so I will try not to speak faster than one word per minute, but you have to realize this is a real strain for me because I am so vastly superior. Ansel was not severely mentally challenged. She'd done fine in school and at the Sky Trails orientation. It was just that this was her first actual day on the job. And Monique had been nasty from the very start. Every one of Monique's frowns and glares and insinuations kept making Angela feel more panicky and stupid. Sighing, Angela glanced up. She needed a break from staring at the computer screen, longing for a post-it. She peered out at the passengers crowding the terminal. Tired-looking families, sprawled in seats, dark-suited businessmen sprinting down the aisle. Which one of them would be the standby flyer who would rush up to the counter and ruin Angela's life? Generally speaking, Angela had always liked people. She wasn't used to seeing them as threats. She forced her gaze beyond the clumps of passengers to the huge plate glass window on the other side of the aisle. It was getting dark out, and Angela could see the runway lights twinkling in the distance. Runway, runaway, she thought vaguely. And then, had she blinked? Suddenly, the lights were gone. No, she corrected herself, not gone, blocked. 
Suddenly, there was an airplane between Angela and the runway lights, an airplane rolling rapidly toward the terminal. Angela gasped. What now? Monique snarled, her voice thick with exasperation. That, that plane, Angela said, at gate 2B, I, I thought it... What was she supposed to say? Wasn't there? Appeared out of thin air? I thought it was going too fast and might run into the building, she finished in a rush, because suddenly that had seemed true, too. She watched as the plane pulled to a stop, neatly aligned with the jetway, but it didn't. No worries. Monique whirled on Angela. Never, she began in a hushed voice full of suppressed rage. Never, ever say anything like that. Weren't you paying attention in orientation? Never say you think a plane is going to crash. Never say a plane could crash. Never even use the word crash. Do you understand? Okay, Angela whispered. Sorry. But some small rebellious part of her brain was thinking, I didn't use the word crash. Weren't you paying attention to me? And if a plane really was going to run into the building, would Skytrails want its employees to warn people? Wouldn't they want them to get them out of the way? Just as rebelliously, Angela kept watching the plane parked at 2B, instead of bending her head back down to, the con to concentrate on her computer. Uh, Monique? She said after a few moments, should one of us go over there and help the passengers unload, or I mean, deplane? She was proud of herself for remembering to use the official airline-sanctioned word for unloading. Beside her, Monique rolled her eyes. The gate agent's responsible for 2B, she said in a tight voice, will handle the deplaning there. Angela glanced at the 2B counter, which was silent and dark and completely unattended. There wasn't even a message scrolling across the LCD sign behind the counter to indicate that the plane had arrived or where it had come from. Nobody's there, Angela said stubbornly. Frowning, Monique finally glanced up. Great, just great, she muttered. I always have to fix everyone else's mistakes. She began stabbing her perfectly manicured nails at her keyboard, and then she stopped mid-stab. Wait. That can't be right. What is it? Angela asked. Monique was shaking her head. Must be a pilot error, she said, grimacing in disgust. Some yahoo pulled up to the wrong gate. There's not supposed to be anyone at that gate until the Cleveland flight at 9.30. Angela considered telling Monique that if Skytrails had banned crash from their employees' vocabulary, then maybe passengers should be protected from hearing pilot error as well. But Monique was already grabbing the telephone and barking out orders. Yeah, Bob, major screw up, she was saying. You've got to get someone over here. No, I don't know what gate it was supposed to go to. How would I know? Do you think I'm clairvoyant? No, I can't see the numbers on the plane. Don't you know it's dark out? With her free hand, Monique was gesturing frantically to Angela. At least go open the door, she hissed. You mean the door to the jetway, Monique said, pointing. Angela hoped that some of the contempt on Monique's voice and face was intended for Bob, not just her. Angela imagined meeting Bob someday, sharing a laugh at Monique's expense. Still, dutifully, she walked over to the 2B waiting area and pulled open the door to the hallway that led down to the plane. Nobody came out. Angela picked up a piece of lint off her blue skirt and then stood at attention, her back perfectly straight, just like in the training videos. Maybe she couldn't keep track of standby codes, but she was capable of standing up straight. Still, nobody appeared. Angela began to feel foolish, standing so alertly by an open door that no one was using. She bent her head and peeked down the jetway. It was deserted and turned at such an angle that she couldn't see all the way down to the plane to see if anyone had opened the door to the jet yet. She backed up a little and peered out the window, straight down to the cockpit of the plane. The cockpit was dark, its windows blank, and that struck Angela as odd. She'd been on the job for only five hours and she'd been a little distracted, but she was pretty sure that when planes landed, the pilot stayed in the cockpit for a while, filling out paperwork or something. She thought that they would at least wait until all the passengers were off before they turned out the cockpit lights. Angela peeked down the empty jetway once more and went back to Monique. Of course I'm sure there's a plane at the gate. I can see it with my own eyes. Monique was practically screaming into the phone. She shook her head at Angela, and for the first time, it was almost in a companionable way, as if to say, at least you know there's a plane there, unlike the other morons I have to deal with. Monique cupped her hand over the receiver and fumed to Angela. The incompetence around here is unbelievable. 
The control tower says that the plane never landed, it never showed up on the radar. The Sky Trails dispatcher says we're not missing a plane. Everything was supposed to land in the past hour pulled right up to the right gate, and all the other planes due to arrive within the next hour are so accounted for. How could so many people just, like, lose a plane? Or how could we find it? Angela thought. The whole situation was beginning to seem strange to her, otherworldly. But maybe that was just a function of being new to the job, of having spent so much time concentrating on the computer and being yelled at by Monique. Maybe airports lost and found planes all the time, and that was just one of the things that nobody had mentioned in the Skytrail's orientation. Did uh, <clears throat> anybody try to contact the pilot? Angela asked cautiously. Of course, Monique said, but there's no answer. He must be on the wrong frequency. Angela thought of the dark cockpit and the way she hadn't been able to see through the windows. She decided not to mention this. Should I go back and wait? Monique nodded fiercely and went back to yelling into the phone. What do you mean this isn't your responsibility? It's not my responsibility either. Angela was glad to put a wide aisle in two waiting areas between herself and Monique again. She went back to the jetway door by gate 2B. The sloped hallway leading down to the plane was still empty and the colorful travel posters lined in the walls. Sky trails, your ticket to the world, seemed jarringly bright. Angela stepped into the jetway. I'll just go down far enough to see if the jet door is open, she told herself. It may be a violation of protocol, but Monique won't notice, not when she's busy yelling at everyone else in the airport. At the bend in the ramp, Angela looked around the corner. She had a limited view, but caught a quick glimpse of the flight attendant's little galley with neatly stowed drink carts. Obviously, the jet door was standing wide open. She started to turn around, beginning, already beginning to debate with herself about whether she should report this information to Monique. And then she heard, what? A whimper? A cry? Angela couldn't exactly identify the sound, but it was enough to pull her on down the jetway. New Skytrail employee saves passenger on first day of job, she thought to herself, imagining the praise and congratulations, and maybe the raise, she'd be sure to receive if what she was visualizing was real. She'd learned CPR in the orientation session. She knew basic first aid. She knew where every emergency phone in the airport was located. She started walking faster, and then she started running. On the side of the jet, she was surprised to see a strange insignia. Tycon Travel, it said some airline Angela had never heard of before. Was that a private charter company, maybe? And then, while she was staring at it, the words suddenly changed into the familiar wing-in-the-cloud symbol of sky trails. Angela blinked. That couldn't have happened, she told herself. It was it was just an optical illusion, just because I, I was running, just because I'm, I'm worried about whoever made that cry or whimper. Angela stepped onto the plane. She turned her head first to the left, looking into the cockpit. Its door also stood open, but the small space was empty, the instruments dark. Hello? Angela called, looking to the right now, expecting to see some flight attendant with perfectly applied makeup, or maybe some flight attendant and a pilot bent over a prone passenger, or maybe an old man suddenly struck down by a heart attack or a stroke, or at the very least, passengers crowding in the aisle, clutching laptops and stuffed animals brought from faraway grandparents' homes, Overtired toddlers crying, fragile old women calling out to taller men. Could you pull down my luggage from the overhead for me? It's that red suitcase over there. But the aisle of this airplane was as empty and silent as its cockpit. Angela could see all the way to the back of the plane and not a single person stood in her view. Not a single voice answered her. Only then did Angela drop her gaze to the passenger seats. They stretched back 12 rows with two seats per row on the left side of the aisle and one each on the right. She stepped forward, peering at all of them. 36 seats on this plane, and every single one of them was full. Each seat contained a baby. Chapter 1 starts with 13 years later, and we find out what has happened uh, to these 13 babies that have mysteriously arrived on this plane that nobody knows anything about. Um, I know you're sucked in and you want to keep reading, but I'm going to ask you to pause for just a couple more minutes so that we can go ahead and talk to the author, Margaret Peterson Haddix. All right, readers, we are here with author Margaret Peterson Haddix. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here with you. Yeah, I, um, I've got five questions and I'm so excited to ask you. Um, and the first one is that you are the author of 
over 40 books, which is just incredible. Um, and I'm curious if you ever worry that you're going to run out of ideas. I can tell you that that is a concern that has entered my mind. Um, I specifically remember, oh, this was like 15 years ago or so when I was on maybe book 20 or something like that. And I started uh, the book that I was working on then, uh, Double Identity, I started thinking, oh, wait a minute, I can't do this because I already did this in an earlier book. I can't do this because yeah. I did an earlier book. And I did start thinking, well, wait, what if I've run out of ideas? And then a bunch of things happened to me that year that were really just weird and unusual. And I thought, okay, there's always life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All sorts of strange things catch up to you and you see things differently. And that's not going to be a problem. Good. Well, maybe you shouldn't make that uh, wish or thought too often because like, you, you don't want to like bring on all those weird things, right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, another uh, question that goes with that whole 40 book thing is that like you must have a system, uh, you know, like some productivity tips. Um, can you share a little bit about your writing routine with us and, and maybe give us a few tips for if there's someone listening who's like, I don't know, you know, how to uh, to increase the output of my writing or to even to even produce a little bit of writing. Um, you're really good at it. So what would you what, what would you teach us? Well, thank you. Um, I kind of I had a very unproductive morning today, so I feel <laughs> kind of like a hypocrite if I'm trying to hold myself up as a model of productivity. But um, generally what I try to do is I try to write during the time of day when I am at my freshest. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a morning person. So generally I try to do, try to focus on writing in the morning and then dealing with other things, email and, you know, all the other things you have to deal with in the afternoon. That's kind of how I structure my day. Uh, it, it was different earlier on, particularly in the early years before I had anything published or didn't have much published. I was going through a lot of, well, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? <laughs> Am I a writer or not? Am I just wasting my time? And I think that is a very common thing. I think that's something that people really do struggle with. And they start thinking, well, you know, maybe my life would be better if I focused on doing all the laundry that I have piled up instead of, you know, taking this time to write. So I think part of it starting out and, and in the early years is just assuring yourself that what you are doing is of value and it, it does help to have dedicated time that you say, I, I mean, I don't know when you find it in your day, but you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour that you say, this is the time that I'm going to sit down and write. And um, for me, for a long time, it was when my kids were little, when they were both taking a nap, that that was what I did with that time was I wrote. That was that was the time. So having dedicated time is very important. Um, I, I think a lot of times what hurts people too is you have these great ideas in your head and then you start writing and it just doesn't come out the way you think it's supposed to. So I think reminding yourself that you don't have to be perfect in a first draft is really important too, that you need to get something down on paper and then you can work with that, that you don't have to know everything right away. You don't have to work out all the problems right away. That tends to paralyze people. So getting past that can be really helpful as well. Yeah, I think there's like this misconception, uh, there's like urban legend about writers that like if you're a good writer, it just sounds good the first time it comes out. And like, it right. really is not <laughs> that way. Um, yeah. I think too, the other part of that is like, yes, there's one person's name on the book, but like, really, it's a whole team of people who work together on it as far as like editors and copy editors and, you know, and beta readers and, and all of that. Um, and so... By putting one name on the book cover, I, I sometimes, I remember when I learned that I was like, wait, I was talking to an editor about something They're like, yeah, I worked on that book. And I was like, oh, oh right. yeah. <laughs> well, and it's kind of like, it's like that thing about social media that you shouldn't compare your inside to pe other people's outsides and, and yeah. your real life to what they're putting out on social media. The same thing is true that you shouldn't read somebody else's finished book that's gone through lots of different editing, revising on their own part, and then also having professional editors look at it. And, you know, you shouldn't compare your first draft that you're the only person who's seen it and it's just, you've just got it down on paper. You should be comparing that to a finished product by someone else. 
Yeah. Yeah. There's a quote out there that's like, don't compare your beginning or middle to someone else's end. Like, yes. Yeah. 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 So good. So good. Okay. Well, like thinking back to the beginning, um, I want you to think back to your very first book, uh, the very first yes you ever got from an agent or a publisher. Can you tell us what that project was and, and what that felt like? Was it a phone call? Was it an email? Like, was it a letter? Like, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, that was my first published book was Running Out of Time which came out in 1995, so, you know, a long time ago, and uh, back then people were not communicating by email yet. I mean, some people were, but not within the publishing mm -hmm. world and definitely not with people I was dealing with, but um, so it was a phone call, and there were kind of different stages to it. That The first thing that was really exciting was when I got the call that an agent wanted to represent me, and uh, the day that I got that call, I was walking on air. I was just ecstatic. I couldn't sleep that night <laughs> because I was so excited. And I was so certain that, you know, that that was it. That meant that my book was going to be published. And um, <laughs> I, I've later, since then, I found out that, that you know, that doesn't always mean that your book is going to be published just because you get an agent. But uh, unfortunately, fortunately, in that case, that is how it worked. Um, so that that was uh, at one point, and then and I'm, I'm trying to think what time of year that was. Um, I want to say spring, I think. And then it was almost a full year before the book actually sold. So, you know, I, I needed oh. to have a little bit of realism there. But when the call came from my agent that uh, the book was that Simon and Schuster was the publisher that had picked it up, that they were going to buy it. Um, it was it was a really stressful time because my husband and I were in the process of moving from Illinois to Pennsylvania, and we were moving to a town that I had never even been to, had never stepped foot in. Um, we had a one and a half year old who was very active and was the kind of kid who, you know, was constantly, if you turned your back, she'd be like sticking her fingers in electrical outlets and, you know, like all and, and parent, pulling things down on herself. She was a very active child. And so it had to be watched every minute. And um, so, you know, I was dealing with that, dealing with, uh, you know, moving because it was the day before we were moving for good. And, um, oh, I had the flu and I was five months pregnant. Oh my so, goodness. So there was so much going on that day. And, um, uh, you know, I picked up the phone and my agent saying, they're going to buy this. And, and as it turned out, they bought both, they were going to buy both my first and my second book at the same time. Cause I had written the second book while I was waiting yeah. on the first book get published and and it was one of those I was so excited but it was also like okay I'm gonna be really happy about this I just don't have time to think about it right now yeah can I call you next week <laughs> yeah it, yeah yeah it was well and it, it was actually like, the timing is really lucky because the my checklist of all these things I needed to take care of before we moved um letting my agent know that we were moving was one of the things that was on the checklist but I had kind of thought, well, I can let her know after we're in Pennsylvania because, um, and, and this was, you know, landline days. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like if she hadn't caught me that day, if she'd like waited until the next week to try to call me, she couldn't have reached me. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, you would have eventually reached out to her like that. Oh, like, I would have. I mean, right, I would it have. Would, it's not like we wouldn't have ever have ever get any of these books ever, but like, right. you're right. right. It, that is so lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would have felt terrible for her because, you know, it's really exciting for agents as yeah. well to be like, yeah, we've got, you know, you're, you're going to have a debut book. Um, it would have been very bad if she tried to call me and it was like, you know, this number has been disconnected. Oh, she would have been so worried. Oh, okay. Well, um, maybe uh, this next question, like if you had a time machine, you know, then you could have, you know, remedied yeah, that exactly. if she, that would have if she hadn't have called you. <laughs> Um, but this book, this book is about time travel and I was looking on your website and it said you had done some research, you know, to make sure that like some of the plausibility and the science and the, you know, some of the things like that were going to work out. But I'm curious, how do you do research about something that doesn't technically exist? Yeah. Um, 
that was, <laughs> that was something I was a little foolish about when I was starting to think about how I was going to have this whole series go. Um, I, I, I'm a former reporter. And okay. so in general, working on any of my books, I am trying to make, if there's, if there are facts to be had, I want to have the facts. Right. Oh yeah. I start writing the book because that's one of the things, you know, if, if something seems really implausible that turns people off and they're like, forget this book, this doesn't yeah, make sense. Yeah, pulls them out of the story. Yeah. So as I was thinking about, I'm going to write this time travel series. Um, how do I do that? And so I did start reading a variety of books. I, you know, like the really heavy duty physics stuff about Einstein's theories. I was reading that kind of thing. And, um, you know, if you go faster than the speed of light, does that make time go backward? You know, all these kind of ideas, that yeah. kind of thing. And I specifically remember there's one book that I read that the title was something like Time, A Traveler's Guide. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I was reading this stuff and taking it very seriously. And then at a certain point, it did occur to me, nobody's done this, <laughs> at least as far as any of us know. So it's not, I, I'm not going to stumble upon the one accurate way to describe time travel what I need to do, though, is to have consistent rules. Okay. And okay. Um, so I, I you know, I kind of needed a framework of something that sounded vaguely scientific. And so I did read kind of the theories about it. And, um, and then I decided that one of the rules that I wanted to have for the time travel was that you can't step into the same time twice the same person can't be in the same time twice. So you can't, okay. you can't exist where you are right now and simultaneously have time traveled back from the future to be in this moment okay. and be somewhere else. And I have to say 90% of the reason that I did it that way was that I thought that's just too confusing. <laughs> if, yeah. it, it, also, if you can be in the same period of time at the same time in two different places, then nothing you do really sticks. Like yeah. it's kind of like you get so many chances to go back and change that particular time that nothing really matters because you can always go back and change it and, right. and, and nothing yeah. is final. Yeah. So that, yeah. that was kind of my thinking and that was as far as I went into these are the rules that I want to have. But yeah. then as I was writing the series, I have time getting so messed up that then I had to, you know, I kept having to add rules in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as you're, as you're talking, I'm thinking a lot of things. I'm thinking Mrs. What's it and the fabric and folding, you know, for a wrinkle in time. <laughs> yes. um, I'm thinking my kids love this movie called Peabody and Sherman, where they have mm -hmm. the way back and they like get in this time traveling machine and uh, they, they go to Sparta and they're in the Trojan horse. And this, so that, and then back to the future. So I have all of these lovely stories just culminating <laughs> in yes, my head yes. that could potentially have been considered research. I don't know. Um, but good. Okay. So you were saying that as you move through the series, you know, you had to like add some additional rules to make things make sense. And, and I am envisioning like your writing office as you're writing this because eight books in a series, I looked it up. The first one came out in 2008. The last mm -hmm. one came out in 2015. Like seven years is a long time. Eight books is a lot of, I'm envisioning like an investigator crime scene, like with all the ropes <laughs> and the, and the photos and the yeah. things like to keep, that's a lot to keep track of. How did you do that? Well, that's kind of like the inside of my head probably looked yeah. like that. that. There were all these, you know, dangling things and things not connecting the way they should have. Um, I, I I did try to keep a lot of it on in my head. I kept a lot of it on paper kind of with the, the historical events that I had to stick to accuracy with. I did it, it kind of as I got further and further and further into each book, I would have research books lying <laughs> open across the floor of my office. I'm, I'm kind of messy and you can kind of tell the farther I get into a story, the, the messier my office gets. You can almost trace the progress of how far <laughs> I am in the book. Um, so it, oh, that it's part super messy. We must be close to the end, right? Yeah, exactly. Because because if it gets any messier, I won't be able to find my way into the office. <laughs> but um, but yeah, and and then I did. I mean, I had to go back and reread the whole series before I wrote the last book, so I could make sure that I was 
tying up all the loose ends. The other thing I will say about, you know, you're citing those set that seven year time period. Um, technology was my biggest problem over that span hey. of time because particularly cell phones, because in 2008 in, and you know, the book was actually written, I started it in 2006. And so between 2006 and 2015, cell phone technology changed so immensely. Yeah. And in the first book, I have uh, Jonah and Catherine sharing a cell phone. And it was like just, you know, a flip phone. It wasn't a smartphone, yeah. just, a, you know, a cell phone that they could use to call their parents when, you know, they needed yeah. to pick up or something like that. And, and I did that because I knew a lot of people, my kids were in middle school at that point. And I knew a lot of pe families who did that. They were like, okay, here's the kid's cell phone. Yeah. And um, yeah. by 2015, nobody was doing that. And a, a lot of middle school kids had smartphones. So yeah. it, you know, I, it was really hard to keep all of that consistent. Yeah. And so I think I kind of went more and more vague about what that type of technology was like. That's a really good tip that if you can't be specific about something, just back away from it a little bit. And then that might be the answer. Very smart. Very smart. Well, this was all so lovely. Um, thank you for the chance to pick your brain. Um, can you tell us um, what you're working on or what's coming out next for you, what you're most excited about? Sure. Um, well, it's kind of a three prong because I have two books coming out this year. I have a book called The School for Whatnots that is a standalone book for middle grade readers that's coming out March 1st. So we're just three weeks away, less than three weeks away. And um, it is about two kids who have been best friends since kindergarten. And when they are in fifth grade, right at the end, they find out that they will probably never be allowed to see each other ever again. Oh. And of course, that is not what they want. No. And while they're trying to figure out how to get around that, they discover some very strange information about their school mm -hmm. and arrangements that their parents have made and kind of their society as a whole. So there are a lot of surprises in that book. So that's coming out in March. And then I also have the start to a new series start coming out in September, September 20th. And the series is called The Mysteries of Trash and Treasure. And the first book is called The Secret Letters. And it is about two kids whose parents own rival junk removal services. Okay. And they find shoe boxes of letters that two other kids wrote 50 years ago. Oh, wow. And there's a mystery connected to those shoe boxes of letters. And there's another mystery that's connected to it as well that actually is connected to them. So that will be coming out in September and it starts a whole new series. Yeah. It's like storage wars, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, cool. yeah. <laughs> very cool. Um, if readers want to connect with you, if they have more questions other than the ones I've asked you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Sure. I do have a website, which is hanexbooks.com. And on that, there is a form to fill out if you want to email me with any of your questions. And I can attest that that, works because that's how I got a hold of you. So <laughs> she does answer her email, you guys, which is so exciting. Thank you. Sometimes it takes me a while. I will say that, but, but yes, I do answer it. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you so much um, for your time. Thank you for uh, 40 and more amazing books. We're looking forward to the ones that are coming out this year and uh, please keep writing. Thank you. Thank you. And you keep doing first chapter Friday. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. To continue reading Found by Margaret Peterson Haddix, check out a copy from your school library, purchase one from a local indie bookstore, or get one via the link in the description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist and all of the other amazing author interviews here on this channel. Thanks for watching, come back again, and remember to subscribe so you get even more great content from the Word Nerd. See you again next time!